activities in the fall. It's a fall winter event, so don't look for any during the summer. But um, we do encourage you to attend the spring seaplane seminar that the Safety Foundation will be holding on April 27th at UAA's Aviation Technology Building. So um, thank you, Airmen, and thank you to the FAA, who has been very supportive and um, encouraging and um, bringing lots of you in for your wings credit, so thank you. So um, the topic tonight um, is mid-air collisions and how to prevent them. It's something that a lot of pilots talk about, especially when they're flying in the Anchorage Bowl and in the Matsu Valley. Um, mid-air collisions can happen anywhere, as we well know. And we have a great panel who have a variety of experiences to share and some advice, hopefully. Our agenda is going to be a panel. Member will give a very short brief presentation. And at the end, we will open it up for discussion. So um, let's see. Um, before I introduce our panel, uh, let's see. Corey Hester with the Airmen's. Is okay? Thank you. Um, we have Oscar. We have Oscar Siegel somewhere. We have Victoria, and I'm not sure if we have any other staff here. Amanda. And then we do have one board member here too, uh, John Dolan, our vice president over there as well. Very good. Thank you, Doug. Um, and then we have Harry Keeling with the Safety Foundation, and he's our chair. I saw uh, another board member, Joan Arnell, here somewhere. Thank you, and I. Don't think there are any more. If there are, you um, So, our panel members. First of all, we have Mike York, who you probably all know. He's a FAST team member, and he's our representative in Anchorage. Next to him is Bruce Markwood, and he's a private pilot who flies out of Anchorage, and he was involved in a mid-air collision in June 2018. Uh, Dr. Marcel Dion will be here later, he got delayed. He's delivering a baby, so he'll be here hopefully soon. Uh, hopefully there's no complications. And um, then we have Sean Brosnahan, who is the Director of Standards with Haglin. And he is um, a commercial pilot, but also a general aviation pilot who flies um, in the local area. And he is um, assisted with their uh, Haglin's Assistant Chief Pilot, who I'm not sure if he's going to be able to actually say anything since he lost his voice, um, but those two work in some of the most um, busy airspace with a complex uh, variety of airplanes because they've got shared airspace and shared runways, um, particularly in western Alaska. Um, and before we get started, I would like to... Um, say hello to Marshall Severson, another one of our safety foundation board members. So a quick, um, just brief review of our rules of engagement. We are here to, just in case, <laughs> we're here to learn. So we're not here to pass judgment or blame. I'm sure everybody has done some armchair quarterbacking uh, like you do on a Monday morning after the game and reviewing accidents and incidents, say, well, I could have done this, or I would have done this, or why did you do that? We're here to learn, and we want to be brief and meaningful in our questions and our comments, and above all, be respectful. So, Mike, you're up first. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Nice to see the older faces that may have seen this before. Maybe we should call them familiar faces and the new faces. Um, so I'm putting this PowerPoint presentation together oh, a couple days ago, and uh, my wife comes up to me and says, oh, is that when we were in Hawaii 20 years ago with the kids? And I says, no, Mary, that's the uh, people who were bigly killed in that mid-air collision. And uh, I don't say we all know, but quite a few of us know that's the one that was at Amber Lake that started uh, the Alaska SeaTac, the Anchorage, or the Matsu, whatever version you want to do that. Um, two aircraft involved, Cessna 180, with the four folks on board, the family you just looked at, and uh, Cessna 206 uh, with a very qualified uh, individual flying that. He ended up uh, with no injuries landing here at uh, Merrill Field, 
unfortunately, um, you know, one evening was uh, destroyed. Well, we couldn't understand why this could happen. Well, you know the government, we gotta stick our nose into everything, and we have another branch called the NTSB, and they say, hey, we have substantiated that there were two airplanes, and they were both on different frequencies. He says, well, how can that be? There's a CTAP in that thing. There's a CTAP up there in that area. You're supposed to be on the same frequency. How could that possibly happen? Well, we found out looking through some of our publications, us, the FAA, that we were a little bit responsible for publishing things that were a little bit erroneous, that maybe a little bit hard to understand, or at least contradicted. So the finding was 22.8 and 22.9 the airplanes were on. How do we know that? Other traffic was in the area, they heard the end number, one called in on one, the other called in on the other. Now this is not something that just happened yesterday. This uh, went on for quite some time. Um, so we uh, got together in this building. By the way, I call this the Rex Ray Drawing. So just to get everybody orientated, down here is Los Angeles, your anchor, you guys call it. Here's Talkeet up here. We all know about CTAS, right? Five miles or something like that. We publish a frequency in there, and you're supposed to say your intentions, right? And the other aircraft, if they're in the area, it's supposed to hear you and say, oh, well, he's on left downwind, I'll do right downwind because nobody's looking, or at least I know where he's at. So I'm going to ask everybody here if uh, the color red is 22A, that's that circle there. The color green is 22.9. Other black down here, uh, this being the Susitna River. What frequency should you be on? That's an old map. <laughs> it is an old map, but the airport's haven't moved. The answer is, I don't know. And if anybody should know, it's me, right? So I should be able to get you this information. So I'm not sure because of the five mile circle. <coughs> so we started looking around and we found out that we issue these frequencies for these airports. It's called a 50 10. So the person who built this airport probably got along with this guy that put this airport and they said, hey, let's be on dot nine right here. One over here said, because I've got to listen to it, right? So I'll be on dot eight. Not such a big deal when you're up here, but what happens when you get down around here in the Anchorage area? Rex Gray, again, <coughs> who was a president of the Airwoods, I think was, thanks, sir, was president of the Airwoods, he came up with it. He simply drew that out. It was like just astonishing. How could this possibly have happened? Well, uh, a little bit of the FAA issuing those frequencies and a little bit of maybe people wanting a different frequency and not doing such a good job. So what we do? <coughs> we decided, and it was decided right here in this building, and it took about three years, how are we going to solve the problem of all those circles? By the way, keep that in mind there, these three circles up here. So we decided, how are we going to do this? We went through 50 different ways to do things. We decided to put it down the Big Sioux River there after about a year. Somebody said, well, that's great. Somebody new attended says, well, what happens if you're on the river? Oh, hell, we don't know. So therefore, we moved it one mile over. Everybody says, well, how far do I know miles away? Well, how do you know where the Class B airspace starts over here? You get pretty darn close, don't you? Then somebody said, well, there's going to be a lot of talk here. I've heard that complaint from a lot of people. A lot of frequency noise, right? A lot of people talking. Yeah, that's because now they're on the same frequency. It can be a bad thing, and it can slow you down, and it can make life a little challenging. So then we thought, well, what do we do? We'll put the people above 3,000 on a different frequency. Great idea, right? Let's do it. We do it for weather's 2,500 feet. Back to where we were. So the idea was to put 22.9 over here, 22.8 over here. Everybody says, Mike, why didn't you run this right down the river here? You got that line going. There. Why, why didn't you run it down? What's this line mean? Well, this line means where the railroad was going to go when we had a little bit of money in the state of Alaska. That would have been a nice dividing line because everybody likes geographic borders, right? We all like geographic borders. We like the bus bar to you. We like Point McKenzie. We like power lines. We like the big suit. These are what we like. So we decided to put it down here. The other reason is we did a study from ATC, and they said, oh, about 
92% of your aircraft that leave out of here, out of Anchorage area here, the populous area, and over here westbound, northwestbound. So if we drew the line down here, then we got a frequency change here, frequency change, frequency change here, we're back to the crazy little circles that I told you about. The problem that we're trying to avoid, we almost recreated. Good to see you, Wags. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why these areas came out like this. And I know. I don't have that information in our bike. <laughs> 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 Boundary, okay. <laughs> that's that's kind of what I've heard before. Anyhow, uh, so afterwards, if you're interested in some feedback and tell me where you'd like to see it moved or something like that, I'm glad to, to entertain it. But again, we spent about three years on this. Your Alphabet Goose, the Alaska Airlines AOPA Association, uh, NIOSH. We had people from uh, Bryant Field. Guy comes up one day. He uh, flies out of uh, um, past Birchwood by the Fred Meyer there. Flies hang gliders. Uh, he flies from there to Glen Allen in a hang glider. We didn't know that. He carries a radio with him. There's a lot of things we learned about the CTAP. We know it's not the best. We know the frequency congestion can be a little bit of a challenge, but you guys know how to handle that. You kind of police yourself a little over there. Uh, <clears throat> Another mid-air collision that we had uh, that same year as the uh, war fatalities was in western Alaska. Uh, Cessna 207 in a caravan, sometimes called the lover's accident. They were boyfriend and girlfriend working for different operators inbound to, was it Bethel, I believe? Look it up. Uh, they ran into each other. So maybe sometimes you wonder why the FAA has that rule. What's that rule? If you're going to use the formation and flying, you're supposed to know what the other person's doing. Maybe not such a maybe such not such a bad rule. Other airplane collision: uh, uh, Haglin Air and a uh, two of Super Cub. Um, the Haglin aircraft had ADS-B on it. Sure, been nice if the other aircraft had ADS-B on it. Speaking of ADSD, anybody fly around Mount McKinley? Anybody like to go flight see Mount McKinley? Yeah, I think everybody does. The operators up there have all the three of the aircraft uh, ADSD equipped. There's no rule that makes them do that because they're not going to be above 180, so 18,000. And they're not in Class C airspace. But they voluntarily did it for 22 aircraft. That's a pretty good thing to hear. Um, you have accidents even where you have uh, some bureaucrats around controlling, right? In Talkeetan, we don't have a tower, but what do we have? Flight service, right? Advisories. Because which one? The one from Palmer? So and this is, uh, as Terry said, this is a student pilot. Here's a 185 operated by one of the air taxis. Uh, you can see the weather's pretty nice. Pretty clear day. Pretty hard to beat, I think. Uh, Take a look here, you can see the back of the aircraft. We know where the fuel goes, comes down here, down to the door post. One student pilot on here, it was his first cross country solo. Decided uh, from Palmer to Dal Kitna. And then of course, a, take a look at the 185 there. Also had one over here um, in the Knick area where the cams are in the farm area. Uh, Alaska State Trooper, Levi. Nice clear day, and then another airplane collided in February, about 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, one gentleman spent a year in the hospital, Levi was back to work after three days. So maybe some of those helmet things might be worth considering. Lake Clark Pass, Navajo and a Cessna 206. Cessna 206, piloted by a very experienced pilot, heading westbound towards Iliamna, Navajo, nine passengers on board coming to Anchorage, tail strike by the 206, I thought he had a bird, came over across Baloo, somebody looks up, says roll up on frequency, rolls up on frequency, says hey, your vertical's dead, he says what? He says your vertical's dead, he says well I think I hit a bird. How do we know it was an airplane that he hit? This 206 guy after he hit him circled around him five times. How do we know that? GPS tattletales, right? They give us all that information when we want to find it. 
so here he is, he circles around, he knows he's hit the airplane. The Navajo doesn't know that the 206 hit it, he thinks he hit a bird. The guy in the 206 keeps circling around, he believes there's an aircraft down there. He turns around, heads back out of the pass eastbound now, gets a little Makina and they go, oh yeah, Romeo, it's a landing at Merrill Field here a little bit. Why is it called with mid-air collision? The guy on uh, Lake Park frequent, uh, pass frequency was on the proper CTAP frequency. This gentleman was listening to Def Leppard. kind of the hard part when we go back to the three circles up on top and the line that sometimes we don't like is sometimes we've got to turn our radio down, aren't we? Because there gets too much chatter. Maybe turn it down for a while, maybe turn it back. Just some things to think about. Um, this one here is a Cessna 207 uh, and a 175. We're lucky that Bruce Markwood, the gentleman sitting here, was the, <coughs> excuse me, in an individual involved in the uh, Cessna 175 accident right here. Bruce was coming eastbound from over in the Tionic area, I believe it was the fish campers. Um, heading eastbound, uh, the 207 was heading westbound. So let's see if this works here. <clears throat> There's a little bit of uh, the ATC tape. Get this rolling for you. Okay, so. We got Bruce here, Cessna 175 heading eastbound. Merrill's over here just to get you orientated. Here's the Cessna 207, we're at 1100 feet. We know as the plane goes up, the airspeed goes down, vice versa. As the airplane goes down, the airspeed comes up. Here's somebody down here at zero feet. I'm not sure he's practicing touch and goes. Here's our EVA aircraft uh, taking off on a departure, heading uh, over towards Chicago. Again, 207, Bruce Markwood, Cessna 175. Here's what we call Big Island here. By the way, there is a walrus camp on that, or excuse me, seal camp on that island. And as you can tell, one of them's going to drop off the screen. <clears throat> Pretty alarming when you're an ATC controller. Probably the only thing more alarming is being Bruce. You can tell he goes out here and makes a right turn. My guess is trying to get things organized. He takes a look around. My guess is he sees something in the water, takes a look around, uh, decides from there that he may needs to head towards safe spot over here is the Cessna 207 that came in from Alexander Creek and landed landed right there in the front deep water that we never ever like to look at, right? I got a pretty good deal on that guy. But in the aircraft um, one fatality at that point. Wasn't sure if there was any more. So we were pretty pretty fortunate. So Bruce, uh, I'm gonna play this again. Uh, I know when you headed into Merrill or like that helped me out and by the way Bruce is a first responder <clears throat> here at station. station five. Bruce is at station five. He's the guy when you have a problem out here at Lake Hood or any of these places, he's the first guy here. So it's his crew that's coming over here to see what's going on. They don't know that it's Bruce. Uh, and you told me about some carburetor heat getting in here in the area. Can you share, uh, share with the group? Yeah, uh, first of all, I've seen that slide now. Uh, four times and it's not easy to watch it. It's probably, it's just as hard right now as it was when I, Mike showed it to me the first time. Um, yeah, I, I'm here by the grace of God. It could have been me instead of the 207 pilot. And, uh, and I, I'm here because I, if we can prevent this from happening again, um, I'm all for it, obviously. So that's why I'm here. Carburetor, I, the, the whole accident basically is um, was highly publicized. It was on you know uh, the news. Had my crash landing at at Lake Hood, and uh, there's an audio clip of my talking with the tower. And at one point, they were wanting me to kind of uh, just kill some time to allow the emergency responders, which. Ironically, with my guys coming from Station Five, so they asked me to fly up to 1,500 feet uh, and fly by the tower, and they're going to assess my landing gear. And uh, I, I went to, to to add some power to climb, and, and my airplane felt like it was going to fall out of the sky. And I, 
stuff that I thought at the time that maybe more damage uh, had occurred from the midair. Um, what I realized a few moments later as I went through my emergency procedures, I pulled my car by and, it, and I had not, I'd neglected to pull, uh, use carburetor heat the whole time throughout the whole accident. And so I, mean, I just had a bad case of carburetor. I cleared that up and was able to. I, I thought I was going to have to land on the beach out here. Off, but. <coughs> yeah, you, didn't you tell me too, Bruce? You had some shaking in the aircraft. Was that from the engine or well, it was all, or disturbance, or you just? It's finished? all like I, I thought in my mind that maybe I got a little piece of the prop because it had come off because it shook so bad, and I, I wonder if I had car ice that bad. But that's what it was. It was carburetor ice, and uh, I cleaned it up. With, uh, so the car heat and the airplane was going fine. It, it, my after we we made contact over the big Sioux, you see my radar track kind of goes off out, and I was basically, first of all, couldn't believe that that had just happened, and I was just shocked. And then uh, I started, you know, realized obviously I just hit another airplane, and so I kind of went off and started assessing my plane. By the grace of God, my airplane flew fine. Um, and so I came back around because then my first responder kicked in and I had seen the other airplane go into the inlet. So I wasn't going to leave until I knew, um, you know, the fate, if I could, the other, of, of whoever else was on board. And so I. Once I realized my airplane was going to work okay, I, I turned back around and I circled and I climbed uh, and just called emergency traffic. Uh, and I was on initially on 122.7, and as I crossed over, I went to 122.9. So I called my emergency traffic on 122.9, and uh, at 206, it was, I heard my call and it came in. And, Assisted, and once the 206 got uh, a GPS coordination of where that airplane was, um, then I felt like I was my responsibility at that point was over. <coughs> I had him assess my plane, and at, um, he told me I was missing my nose wheel and my left ear, and uh, and, then, and then I just I moved on, uh, and switched over. Tough lesson to learn, huh? Yeah. And uh, thanks, Bruce, for that. Uh, any questions for Bruce that maybe aren't personal that could be uh, you could focus towards him or myself or, or certainly welcome at this time? Landing light on? My landing light was not on. Uh, I had the old style that uh, I put on when I'm close to the airport. I've, I've changed some things. I've got LED lights. Mm -hmm. got Max pulse switch. Um, so there's there's definitely things we can do. Yeah. Do you all have a DSP now? I have the Stratus that actually it it works with a transponder. If somebody has a transponder on my it's an ADSB in. I don't have ADSB out. <clears throat> but it's amazing how many airplanes are out there. It gives me the uh, and this is an older Stratus because as we know everything's expensive. Um, the older Stratus, and it it gives direction to the other airplane if they have a transponder and the altitude in relative, it, you know, related to my altitude. So you'll see, you know, an airplane going this way at it'll say plus two hundred. We maybe all have that already. Yes. I believe all the Haglund's aircrafts are ADSB equipped. Yep. So that's a good in and out. Okay, that's great, thanks. Yes, sir. I'm just curious, um, just, did you see the other aircraft at all? Or? I did. Uh, I saw, I was talking to a Super Cub going, and I was on 122.7 at this time. The Super Cub was going opposite direction at 600 feet, and I communicated with him, and he was off, he was north of my airplane. And as I was passing him, I saw the shadow of 207 on the beach of the big island and I was like saw my shadow saw that shadow and I was like oh wow 
wow, there's another plane here. And I looked up from that point, and his spinner was basically in my windshield. And I had enough time, I, I just, like I said, I'm here by the grace of God. I pulled back as hard as I could on my, on my yoke, and um, we made you know, contact. And it was hard, it was hard enough to set off my yoke. see him right at the last second. And closing speed, I'm going 125, and he was probably doing 140. So, I mean, that's you know, fast. <clears throat> One of the, the other things that you can get is Garmin has the radio that you can monitor. A lot of these technologies have come on, you know, manufacturers learn FAA, Airmen's Association. What's the saying on the NDSB? It's from somebody's tragedy that we learn and we all become stronger. So, written and blood. Written and blood, yeah. So, thanks, Bruce, for coming up here. Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> somebody else that was going to show up that was also in the mid-air, he's unable to make it, and that was a gentleman uh, with a super cup over here, uh, he's in Kodiak now, he's stationed down there with the Alaska State Troopers. And, uh, I'm sure his statements would be saying so as Bruce's. Are you looking for time here? I have a couple more minutes. I have a couple more minutes. Okay, so we'll take it up. So everybody says, what's the FAA doing about this, right? We're passing rules, we're making you get ADSD, we're making you get wigwag lights. I actually have a picture of your mall there with the lights on and with a mob. Fit all the difference in the world. Uh, so what we do, the Lake Clark accident, we went down to Lake Clark people and we said, hey, Lake Clark people, um, why don't we put some reporting points in the past and why don't you get on CTAP? And they said, great, how about we put Hammond Bay in there? Everybody goes, Hammond Bay, where's that? Well, that's Jay Hammond, right? His wife lives there. Bella, do you know that if you fly out of Lake Clark? The reason I learned that is Harry sent me down there when I worked for OAS. Other than that, I don't know where Hammond Bay is. But I do know where Tommy Island is. I do know where Sandbar is. I do know where Otter Lake is. And I sure as heck know where the weather camp is, right? So what we did was we go ahead and put these on the chart. What happens when we put something on the chart? All the charts information you get on your electronic databases, whether it's four flight or anything, they buy from us, us being the U.S. government. Send us a check, we send them the information, all these updated things come on there. So that's why you see these reporting points on your chart today, because of that reason. I'm just going to say one thing there's a lot of bleed over from that to the one from the mountain there. Yeah, and then again, remember remember the three circles? Don't ever forget those, because the more frequencies we put in there, the more chance you're going to have of not being on there. Let's go back to the Tionic and Beluga area. Anybody here from ATC? I don't think so good, so I'm safe. Um, <laughs> with today's technology, at 300 feet, they can pick you up. The carriers that fly into Beluga regularly out of Merrill Field, which is Spurnack Air, they fall right down to the surface and then right back out. So don't think that you can't talk to ATC. Remember when I talked earlier about stratify, stratifying the area and making a frequency above 3,000 feet? And then I said, well, what are we going to do with weathers at 2,500 feet? I think we kind of answered that. But the folks at ATC can pick you up that low and will watch for you. And they will point out traffic. We're very fortunate. Our ATC guys up here actually have our flyers. Uh, Jamie Conkler, Clint Blasix, I could uh, tell you six or seven. If you fly northbound at Willow at 400 feet, they can pick you up. Why not talk to them? It's free. You've already paid for it. Remember those airports I told you that existed? These are the ones that we know about. See the identifiers? There's 173 of those there. Think about that three rings. You want a separate frequency here? I don't think you do. I think you do until you see the big picture.
and that was the problem, not the problem, but the issue with us in the working group when we put this together. We said, well, how could this be? Larry Todd, are you here? Good. Um, <laughs> he has a runway up there. He called me for years and said, Mike, you gotta get these guys on the right frequency. They're doing everything wrong. I just can't take it any longer. We drew the line down here. Everybody got mad because there's a lot of chatter. Larry says, oh, all those guys are on the radio. You gave me a different frequency to talk on. We had him on 2255. What did he do wrong? Nothing. And he was always mad because nobody was on his frequency. He got that and he says, wow, this is pretty good. So there are some good things that come out of these issues. There again is the line. You've seen it uh, quite a few times. Everybody says, I need a handout. I need a supplement. I need something. We put this on the chart. It's simple. If you're going up on the right is 8, left is dot 9. And don't worry if you get on the wrong one. Somebody will tell you. <laughs> so it's not, it's not that complicated. Yes, sir, Mary. Maybe I missed this. What frequency was the other aircraft? I didn't ask. <clears throat> I didn't ask. I can do that through the report. I just never got that far. Well, what I get from him is, is what I and he was talking to approach at one point, but then switched to company. So, being a guy who's flown that route for about 20 years, took the mail every day to Tyone. That's what we would do when we get to the big suit, we drop approach and get to company frequency. So, we do, are you picking up three, four, seven, nine? pretty typical. Not the best way, but that's what happens. Good question here. Um, so everybody says, well, Mike, that stupid line you got there, why don't you put that on uh, these magic boxes that we got? Well, the FAA spent a lot of money and sent me to a group called the Charting Forum. They're the people who says this magenta line means a certain thing. They're the person that says this flag means a certain thing. They're the people who says this color means a certain thing. Why not? That's I'll just draw the damn line on the chart for me, right? Because if you draw it on a paper chart, it'll get on the electronic chart. And everybody's got electronics now, right? Because we know we're going away from paper, right? If A's getting rid of that stuff, I think they'll probably make it where you can't afford it. They said, well, the people in the lower 48 don't understand what that line is. And if you looked at it logically, they're right. So when you go to the charting forum, you've got people from Lutanza there, you've got people from Delta, you've got people from Alaska. Oh, I know, you're going to say, put something caution down here. Well, the FAA has big uh, think tanks, and the more cautions you put on an approach plate, the less cautions people play, pretend to, or excuse me, uh, pay attention to. So those are some of the pitfalls. So back to the three circles. Sometimes when you think you're helping things out, you're not. So we had to kind of live with that. I went there twice and that did work out. All right, everybody refer a quick test or are you going to listen to Marcel for a minute? Let's listen to Marcel. All right, well, that's all I got for you guys. Uh, we're not going to go away, but let's give Bruce a big hand for showing up.
speak about that at some point in time. But in any event, so this is just a standard FAA, you know, pilot vision thing. Uh, most of what I'm going to talk about actually is in here. So we've got hearing, vestibular, you know, your sense of balance. Uh, you've got the seat of the pants type sensation and vision. You know, that's, that's how you integrate all that information uh, to give yourself a good situational uh, picture, uh, good essay picture. But your Mark I eyeball is probably the most critical. That's where you tend to get most of your information from. Um, it is a complex organ, and that's something, but it does have some limitations. And it's important to be aware of that. Uh, and there are some daytime limitations, nighttime limitations. So I want to mention a little bit about physiology of the eyeball. So you've got central vision, you know, when you look, focus on something, and then you've got the peripheral vision. So central vision, um, the highest concentration of what we call cones or cone cells, that's your color perception, but it's also the type of retinal cell that is able to receive the most information uh, you know, in daylight conditions. So it's concentrated on the area of the central retina called the fovea, or foveal vision, also known as central vision. Um, and that's where visual acuity comes from, you know. For, uh, for pilots, you know, if you're class one, class two, distant vision is very important. Um, and that's why the standard is 2020. For general aviation pilots, it's not as strict, but there's still a limit where you can kind of let it slide, but it's about 2040 uh, or better. So, central vision, and then the peripheral vision uh, contains the highest concentration of rods or rod cells. Now, rod cells um, are good at detecting movement or, or flashing lights in the periphery, and it's to draw your central vision to where it's detected. But the peripheral vision is actually mostly on the subconscious level. And naturally a pilot will look if something triggers it on the, you know, in the periphery or up here. So your entire field of vision goes from about 95 degrees there all the way to 95 degrees here if I'm looking straight ahead. Uh, so I can see my arms moving over here, you know, just behind me. Uh, so about 190 degrees altogether, 50 degrees up here, and then I have to move my head up to focus higher than 50 degrees, um, and about 70 degrees below here. Um, so the greatest obstacle to vision is your aircraft. Um, you can't see under the nose, you can't see up there, or somebody's quartering in, into you. Um, so keep that in mind. Now, on the back side of this sheet, and I, I took this from the Naval Aviation uh, Medical Research Lab, and, uh, sorry, I don't have the, for those that don't have it, but you can look to, you know, neighbors if you haven't. But there's what they call the visual detection rule. And what that basically shows is at distance, it basically is just, you know, the central one or two degrees you know, several nautical miles that you can actually focus on, but it's very narrow. And as it gets closer, that lobe gets bigger as your peripheral vision, you know, starts picking up stuff here. But peripheral vision does not have any distance to it. So that's one of the things is, um, you know, central vision, daytime, it's good. As long as your visual acuity, your glasses are good. Um, the issue with central vision is at night, the cones don't work. Uh, and cones are your color perception and the great detail that you can see as you focus. So the rods take over, that's your peripheral vision. So because you've got lack of rods right in the center of the eye, where you've got mostly cones, there's a blind spot at night, uh, right in the center of your eyeball. Now, 
it's not a problem unless you're looking directly at something. So, you know, the, the recommendation is to look a little bit off center so that you can at least, you know, if you're trying to see something in, uh, in, in, in the night, um, sometimes when you look at it directly, it actually fades away. You know, because it's now in that one spot where the rods are not picking it up. Um, there's, there's also an anatomical blind spot, and this applies primarily in the daytime, but it's a, still a factor at night. And the anatomical blind spot is basically, um, that's where the retinal nerve attaches to the back of the eyeball, back to the retina. And uh, there's what they call a macula in that area, um, but the, uh, the vision, the blind spot is, um, if, if, it's, if you have stereo vision, if you've got both eyes, it's not an issue because one eye will compensate for the other because you can't have an object in both blind spots at the same time, okay? Now, here's the issue. If you've got a windscreen or a windshield post covering one, you know, one section of that area, uh, and this aircraft approaching you is in your blind spot, you're not going to see it. So, there's a, uh, there's a diagram, a second image down here, that if you actually you know, cover one eye and focus on that yellow target, and then move that thing, you're going to actually see the airplane disappear you know, from the eye that's open. And it disappears when it hits that blind spot. So it's real. Um, and your blind spots are basically slightly off center in, the, in those two directions. Alright. Um, in a. Pardon? In a. Okay. If you have any questions, you know, raise the hand or I'll hang around afterwards as well. Um, if, um, if you're in a featureless sky where it's, you know, just flight clouds out there, there's nothing to focus on, the tendency for the eye bone is to relax its focal point and that basically brings that focus about 10 to 20 feet right in front of your nose. So if there's something at 30 feet or beyond, it says, though, in effect, you don't see it, or if there's something there, it's not clear. Uh, so that's the reason where good scanning habits, that's how you overcome that, because you don't let the eyes relax in that relaxed focal point position. So uh, keep that in mind. So when we're talking about visual scanning, um, again, there's no right way, there's no best way. It's whatever works for you, and as long as it's comfortable and you can use it all the time, um, that's what you do. But there are some general recommendations. Uh, when you scan, first of all, keep in mind you got that central one or two degrees. So you want, and then as it gets closer to you, it gets to about 10 degrees. Uh, and that's how that lobe goes. So what you want to do is scan, do your target acquisition for at least a second, you know, so that the computer processes what the, the computer, <coughs> the eyes are seeing, and then move a little bit to one side or the other, you know, in a pattern, whatever pattern you use, but no more than 10 degrees, because if you move, you know, from one second to the next, and it's 15 or 20 degrees, you've got a region there that you have not scanned between those two areas. So keep it, you know, 10 degrees, 10 degrees, 10 degrees roughly, and then come back to inside the cockpit, you know, refocus briefly. But in VFR conditions, your eyes should primarily be outside scanning. And then, you know, check back with the instruments periodically. Um, so head on the sit, on the swivel, you've heard that. Um, and then um, the scanning, you want to do it at least 60 degrees there and 60 degrees there all the way here. That's your threat area you know, for oncoming aircraft. Now, granted, statistics show that a collision, the 
the aircraft is coming from behind. That's more common. Uh, it's about five times more common, actually. So they're quartering from behind or coming down or coming up into you from behind. So you're not seeing it. That's where radio calm comes in. Uh, so that you keep that, you know, make yourself visible to other people, either, you know, through the radios, your lights, like uh, you mentioned, or somebody mentioned, uh, you know, in a high traffic area, near airports, traffic patterns, that kind of thing. Um, and there's a diagram at the bottom here, you know, of a couple examples of a scanning technique that somebody can use, but it's basically, you know, develop that technique and use it. Uh, and it's so that you can keep those eye muscles, you know, that focus the lens, you know, keep it going back and forth down to the instruments, right? Um, and let's see what else, Mike? Yeah, keep the windscreen clean. Um, if you got that big splat that happens to be at the spot where you got an aircraft coming in. Now, between 10 and 2 o'clock, if you've got an aircraft that basically is coming directly at you, there's not much relative motion. No, it's just, you know, at this is just getting a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And then at the last few seconds, that thing just goes, whoa, right? Uh, because now, you know, you see it in your peripheral vision, you know, that's not too far in front of you, and then you go, oh, crap. Um, so, keep that in mind. Uh, night flying, oxygen. Um, so, your eyes actually start being affected by the relatively low oxygen level at about 5,000 feet. You start losing some of your uh, visual capability. At 10,000, it's significant. So, you know, for sure at night, if you're at, you know, 10,000 above uh, sea level, you probably shouldn't be using oxygen, or at least it's recommended. Uh, I don't know what the FAR says, I forgot, it's been a while, but. Any questions? All right, so. Yes, ma'am. If you were to give one piece of advice for pilots who might be getting older, older eyes, yeah. what would you recommend that they could do to at least maintain their ability to see? So, uh, first of all, as a person gets older, the higher the chances of getting eye diseases, the, you know, degenerating eye diseases, the macula, the the retinas, so I think if you're somebody that's you know in the mid to late 50s onward, it's a good idea to just see an eye doc annually, just so that you can maintain what you have. The second thing is make sure you get adequate prescriptions. The third thing is cataracts. Now, cataracts usually start with slight hazing, and for the most part, in the daytime, it doesn't cause an issue, except at night. Halos, flares, starbursts, and it distorts you know, your ability to see adequately, even with a mild cataract. So cataracts are caused by ultraviolet, ultraviolet radiation on the lens. It just basically changes the color of the lens, uh, thickens it into an opaque color. So wearing glasses, eye protection, as you're getting through life is not a bad idea, uh, just to keep the ultraviolet radiation down. Anything else? I was asking for a friend. I think. Any other questions? So thanks for your attention. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you all. And uh, if there's any questions, you know, feel free to give me a call at the regional flight services office here in town. Um, and uh, let me know if there's any. I, I do a lot of phone calls, and it's like, hey, Doc, what's going on with my package at Oklahoma City? Kind of so, um, we can certainly check the system to see where it's at. Sometimes we can move it forward. Uh, but I try to do my best to keep those.
rules, exams, and special issuances moving forward. Thanks for your time. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, simple The machine for blood pressure stuff outside your office is it calibrated accurately? No. Breathe <laughs> so low. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not bad, but if you're kind of a borderline blood pressure kind of person, um, you're not going to get an accurate reading necessarily. So certainly if it reads high, you can knock on our door, we'll check your pressure for you. We're right there. <laughs> but it would be you know, a good idea to check the pressure. The machine is on. But it's not the best machine. It's kind of old. All right, thanks. Thanks, Doc.
recently welcomed uh, Pen Air into the fold and look forward to learning from them. They are a very old time company and, and have great experience and are very well respected in Alaska. We look forward to working with them as well and welcome them to uh, our company. Uh, Dylan and I both work on the 135 side of the house. Uh, we fly, um, we launch about 2,100 flights per week. Give or take uh, 100,000, a little over 100,000 per year all, all, all over Alaska. Um, we operate four aircraft types. Uh, our piston single, the Cessna 207, is uh, one of our workhorses of the fleet, affectionately known as the sled. We also operate uh, caravans, about the same number of those, about 25 207s, and we have about uh, 28, 29 caravans, give or take. Our Piston Twin is a uh, PA-31 Navajo Chieftain, and we also operate uh, nine Beach 1900s, or uh, turbo prop. We have nine bases, which serve over 100 communities in Alaska with scheduled service. And if you throw in the charters, we operate just about everywhere. So I have a history with mid-airs and uh, collisions. We were involved in uh, 1999 when uh, the FAA and a variety of other organizations started pushing for the ADSB. Uh, our aircraft, we're proud to say, were part of the uh, inception and proving of that. Uh, we were fortunate to be involved in it and uh, to this day uh, gain greatly from it. Each one of our aircraft is, uh, Aaron pointed out, each one of our aircraft is ADS-B equipped, both in and out, so we have a TV screen that shows anybody else with ADS-B or a transponder on. Not everybody has that, but uh, at this point, the vast majority of us in Alaska do. <coughs> so, uh, we follow that up through testing and adoption, and, and again, we have each of our aircraft have that today. Despite our awareness of the threat, uh, and our preparations to guard against <coughs> Two years ago, three years ago now, I guess, we lost a very experienced and well-respected <coughs> of our own airy race. Uh, you saw the pictures. It was a uh, mid-air. It was kind of a typical mid-air. Beautiful day out towards Russian mission. Uh, airy race was in a caravan, and there was another pilot in a super cut out in western Alaska. There's not a whole lot else around, except one little airport, and the two of them bumped into each other, and everybody in that uh, incident uh, passed away. So, it's uh, near and dear to our hearts. Harry was uh, a long time ago. Um, perception. In the 207, you're traveling about two miles a minute. Uh, I understand that uh, most of these accidents aren't head ons, but at, at two miles a minute, your closure rate is 35 seconds to impact with somebody coming at you with another 207. In a caravan, you're going about 145 knots shrinks to about 20 seconds. Then you add the typical time to identify a pilot, which is about 10 seconds for a pilot. Uh, a little longer for me, a little less for the other one. There's the age difference, but uh, you have uh, very little time if you start to get close like that. In Bethel, uh, let me start with the, uh, uh, Mary uh, mentioned, uh, in Anchorage where I've flown uh, most of my life, there's a tremendous amount of traffic coming and going from here in the valley, hence the uh, new frequencies. Uh, Bethel is not a whole lot different except it's mostly professionals. Uh, nevertheless, we operate 18 aircraft out of Bethel on a daily basis, um, and there are a number of other operators, and on a, on a good day, you'll have 100 aircraft coming and going from that place. Uh, there is a control tower, but they don't have radar. Uh, most of the planes, but not all of them, do have uh, ADSB. I'm going to guess 90% in Bethel. Yeah. Uh, between 70 and 80. I would say, okay. There's a fair number that don't, but most of them still do. Um, so, uh, Bethel, especially, is quite a busy hub for us. And we, uh, especially recently, we've had uh, a number of near misses in aircraft to the point where it's become something that our company is spending a lot of attention on. We uh, file reports quickly. We're not trying to get anybody else in trouble. What we're trying to do really is get radar over there if at all possible. It's 
some sort of a solution which keeps all of us out of each other's way. Uh, with that number of aircraft, we just haven't been able to uh, come up with a plan that, that works reasonably safely. There's too many close calls. And so we're working very hard in that. That said, every one of our nine bases has uh, at least five or six airplanes coming and going if it's only us. And often there's another operator on the field. So we're very well aware of the seat of the uh, necessity involved. Since it's all VFR, uh, when you're IFR, obviously the uh, system takes care of that for you, the separation. But, uh, our ongoing efforts to mitigate this risk involve uh, training, a uh, variety of procedures, and uh, radio calls. Uh, the training we use, for example, on uh, each one of our flight forms where we're doing a flight training with uh, one of our new pilots, there's a unique line item for, um, for collision avoidance. We can watch every new pilot for that, and everyone who upgrades has to be checked off and be satisfactory. We also teach pilots to keep their head outside the cockpit. One of the things new pilots and sleds do very commonly is they'll uh, take off at full power, 2,850 RPM, and at 400 feet we roll the prop back to 2,700 max continuous power. And uh, every new pilot looks at the dashboard and does this 11 times. And uh, so what we do is say, if your hand knows how many times 11 times it is, <laughs> look outside. Turn the knob 11 times and then briefly look back and see if you got it and make minor adjustments. But you can spend 10 to 15 seconds looking outside for traffic instead of monitoring your wrist. It's uh, just a simple thing, but it, it helps a lot. If you're taking off, if you're in the pattern where there's a lot of higher probability of somebody else showing up. Uh, so we'll set the manner of full pressure just a tiny bit low. We want you to roll the prop out and then full pressure comes back up. Voila, if you practice that a little bit, you're squared, which is our quad power. We also, every pilot, we're teaching them to uh, lift the wing before a turn. If you're too little long, you need to go one way. Just take a quick look. We all have high, we're flying high wings except our uh, Navajo and the, uh, the, uh, the beach, which are usually flying high far anyway. So uh, the caravans and the uh, 207s have a little higher time looking up and seeing something that might be in the area, but just above it. So raise your wing and look. Just simple examples of what we're trying to impress upon our new pilots. If they start thinking about some of these little things, then they just keep it in mind overall when they fly. Lower the nose during climb out. Uh, the 207 especially has a terrible sight picture. The nose is up in front. It's got a really long snout. And when you raise it, uh, if you're climbing at a VY or even less than VY, uh, you can't see the darn thing. So uh, lower the nose a little bit. The engine better and you get much better this way. Uh, and the biggest thing is situational awareness. When you're coming into the St. Mary's or Bethel or whatever airport you're coming into, listen, not just your own radio call outs, which are critical for other pilots, but listen and know where that other pilot is coming from. Because they'll say, I'm northwest 10 miles, inbound plane, overhead left traffic. You should have, uh, just like they say about controllers, I, I don't know their business, but I know they get a picture in their mind. Pilot, when you're coming in and listening to other traffic, you need to get a picture in your mind of where everybody else is. And that way, you can space yourself and there's not this uh, big panic on downward when everybody shows up in the same spot. Uh, so situational awareness is one of the most important. Uh, procedures in our aircraft, lights on at all times. About 18 months ago, we started that um, for the very reason that uh, we discussed. If you been out there flying and you see those pulse lights, we don't have those on our aircraft, but they're pretty cool. You pick them out right away. Uh, nevertheless, if you do see lights coming to you, towards you, it doesn't matter if it's dusk or dawn or daylight, you're going to pick that aircraft out a lot more quickly. And so company policy is, once you get on the runway, every light is on until you get off the runway. Uh, ADSB, we used to fly regularly. If the ADSB went out in one of our aircraft, we deferred for a little while. Uh, well, we stopped doing that. It took us a while, but we finally backed that off to non-deferrable. So if one of our airport, one of our uh, aircraft landed in uh, Sheldon Point, which is a little village, uh, they have the authority to go back to Bethel, or back to St. Mary's, back to one of our bases for repairs, but they won't be flown again until the ADSB is fixed. So 
not only do we have the reception to see everybody else who has to be in and out, but we are doing all we can in this AEI as a flock of flyers to make sure everybody else can see us. We also have the uh, benefit of having a variety of radios in the cockpit. This was one of the most serious things to me when I went from GA to commercial was this stack of radios and everybody chattering all the time. Uh, but we finally got the hang of it and, and now it feels weird with only one channel when I go out to fly general aviation. Um, since we do have that benefit as a commercial operator, we have every one of our aircraft has at least two and uh, aviation radios and one marine band which we use for our company frequency. And so we'll often have one on CTAP. If you're in the caravan, you'll probably have one on center, but then you'll have one on if there's another, wherever you're going to, if it's a different uh, frequency, we'll have that one dialed up already and we'll be listening to it. And that's a real benefit because when you're, uh, the, the map that you had up here, that had 128 and 122.9 on it as well, because when you know you're going from one to the other, you can get ahead of it and start listening to that before you cross that mountain. Uh, radio columns. We try very hard to use demand standard phraseology from our pilots. Uh, no, and about ready to roll out. Um, take off. I'm coming in. <laughs> that's one of the things we like. You don't say I'm 10 miles out. That's a circle that's 10 miles radius. And it doesn't help anybody. You've got a basic idea that somebody's 10 miles out. But if you don't know where they're coming from, that's not helpful. Uh, our pilots use the, de the 10 mile call. We always use the uh, cardinal headings of the compass. It's not just north, east, east, north, east. <laughs> but we use north, northwest, south, southeast, whatever it is, so people have a very good idea where you're coming from. Uh, the next call is usually three miles, and each of these includes altitude, your direction of travel, and intentions. If it's a right traffic airport, we'll say that. If you're coming from the far side and you have to go over top, we'll say that. So that whoever knows, it has the same opportunity to paint a picture in their mind that we expect when we're listening for uh, other traffic as well. Also, try very hard to avoid slang. We do have uh, uh, a company frequency that we'll get on and, and talk to uh, our colleagues that are either up in the air or the folks that are expecting us on the ground, but that is, is pretty limited. We'll transfer back off of that and pay attention to the uh, air frequencies, whether it's the CTAP or whatever else is close, so we can take that into the ground. Despite uh, all of the advances in aviation over the years, the dangers, like collision uh, still play the client. Consequences of one of these mishaps tends to be very high. Uh, it's, incumbent, it's incumbent on each and every one of us to employ procedures consistently that minimize this risk. That we remain vigilant, especially on those beautiful days when you tend to let down your car. And that we continue to explore these ways to uh, minimize the danger of the air collision. So, once again, thank you very much for the invitation. seeing anybody unless they have ADSB power. You have to have ADSB in. Yeah.
altitudes, this is a big one. I mean, everyone's familiar with the VFR altitudes plus 500 feet. Um, typically, you know, a lot of days the weather doesn't allow above 3,000, so, um, you know, we're down 500, 1,000, 1,500. And it seems like everybody gets very fixated on being at that, that hard altitude. They want to be at 1,000, they want to be at 1,500. Um, if it's a clear day, they want to be at 35 or 45. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being at, you know, 1,720 feet. In fact, that's something that, that we teach a lot of our pilots is, um, you know, don't, you know, it's, it's beautiful, it's be a far flight. No one's holding you to an altitude. Uh, you know, getting fixated on a thousand feet probably, you know, isn't going to do any good. Where if you bump it up to 1,200, 1,300 feet, you know, that could that could save your life. Um, another um, thing to bring up was radio calls. So in, in Bethel, we've got 40 different uh, airports, communities that we we're serving. With us, there's at least I'm going to say five operators, including us on, in Bethel. These airports, everyone's plugging in their GPS and they're going on a straight line from Bethel to wherever it may be. So on any given day, you could have a uh, very uh, commonly you know, two airplanes on the same route, one's departing, one's leaving. So the altitude uh, is a big one, you know. Get on those on altitudes. Additionally, we're teaching uh, offsetting the course. So we plug in our GPS, you can offset a mile to the right of the course. That gets you off that direct line which everybody else is going on. Um, one more, lastly, with uh, frequency. So when you take off, uh, again, you know, you're on tower, you get out of the airspace, you switch over to your, your CTAP. Um, if your airport's 60 miles away, you might not be making a call until you're 10 miles out, or most other people probably won't make a call until they're 10 miles out, but there's still 50 or 60 miles of you know, distance to cover there. So another thing that we teach is as soon as you take off, you clear the clear space, get on that, you know, that uh, frequency and make a call, hey, we're off Bethel for Tuxuk, climb it at 2,500. So anybody else on that you know, frequency coming back, when it's out there, they're going to hear that. They're going to know, okay, you know, I can play accordingly. Uh, so just some of the little things that, yeah, I don't know, if we pioneered necessarily, but that has been kind of passed down and we've been uh, teaching our guys. Speaking about the offset courses, anybody fly Dead Horse Park commercially? Take a look in the supplement. Uh, as Dylan said, you can leave Dead Horse or SCC as they call it. You want to go to Park? It's a straight line, right? That's how I do it as a visitor, and I'm pretty sure that's how everybody else here in the room would do it. Well, the locals up there, i.e., Conco and their contractors, they fly five miles off the course. Why? Offset, just why Dylan said. They're the majority of the traffic going back and forth, therefore leaving room for you and I when we say, oh, I want to go to Kapar and leave it direct. So there's little things that companies are doing that actually help all of us, and that's, that's a real good example. So thanks for sharing. Does anybody have any questions for our Market today. This is a real problem. And these aircraft 
that are equipped out in Western Alaska, all those aircraft were equipped <coughs> without transponders. Without transponders. And I know that technology is available, but we're not, we're, it's not coming to us. I don't, I'm not sure why. But as a FAA, I do challenge you to um, look into this because we need a better solution. Zach Babbitt and that cub that hit Harry out in Western Alaska next to Russian missions, he's on top. You know, you would have had to install $10,000 worth of equipment just to get the ADSB in and out. I'm not making excuses uh, for anybody, but I have to tell you, if there was a better solution, then, you know, Zach and Harry would be alive today. That's all I can say. Thanks, Dr. Yeah, I think that's uh, a good comment. Uh, the fees are coming down. You may not know this, but in drones or UASs, we actually have a device called Sensinavoid. It actually sees a target and then changes its altitude. So there are innovations that are changing that will probably drive the price down. I was in town. How many people got ADSB in here? Wow, great. Okay. Uh, Bob, what's your cost? <laughs> what's your sure. number? Five thousand dollars. All right. So there's. Well, but he had some of the equipment in, I guess. Yeah. You were in Well, I pulled my. I had a Garmin three twenty seven. I pulled it out, and she let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell who's the what. The bottom. <laughs> she, she approved it. My instrument was like she approved it, and I put the three twenty seven. So it, it was that transponder came out three forty five. I mean, it, it, the tray had to come out. You'd think Garmin would make. It. Hey, pull this one out and stick right in the same tray, but no. And then it's I have a 430. So it's tied into the 430. The 345 has the ARs, which you know, got tension right. The iPad's in front of her, she's watching it the whole time. She's not fine, but she's watching it. And I'm looking outside. Which is another point. You don't have it. There's a lot of people just like you that don't have ADSB out. And they, I'm not sure if you ever will. We have a cup. It has a mobile transponder. But when we go up in the valley, nobody sees us either. And it's going to be that way for a long time. So look outside. Well, and I think we need to educate. Because I don't think people realize the conundrum we're in here. We're not being sold the products that we need. Yes, sir. You can experimental. And for 500 bucks, I got an iPad and a Stratux. And uh, I was safe from uh, overtaking RV6 because I could see him coming up behind me. And so with the iPad and my little transponder, I could see where I was on the iPad. And then the Stratix, which you can get from Amazon, it's like six pieces, put them together. My son has the wizardry to be able to like, figure out how to plug it into this USB thing. But that's it's less than $300. And that's only ADSB. It doesn't help the output. But it's a start. It, and it sure helped me see and have SA to avoid an RV6 that didn't see me. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Came in on ADSB in and out, and Bush wanted to save me more time because when I'm getting out in the airport, I'm looking for fine enough. I'm not looking at the screen, so that voice saves me. Um, the other thing is I have the LED, uh, LED flashing lights, and um, then they're plus because birds fear me now. Yeah. Get out of the way. I've got a whole box of geese dive and get out of the way. So besides other planes seeing me and reporting me, that flashing scares our birds, eagles, and geese. So it's well worth it just from that. Back, sir. The concern I've had, and I'm sure there's other people here that fly out uh, across Point McKinney and then northwest bound uh, in Salt Peak, Arizona. Um, the air traffic control always wants us to fall at 25, you know, maintain BFR at or below 2,500 feet. And there's an awful lot of us going and coming all at or below 2,500 feet. Um, I, also, I usually, almost always, going out, I like to climb to 22 or 2,300 before I leave here because I've had a friend that ended up dying in the inlet when his plane didn't make it across. And so I thought, well, you know, when you leave, it seems like the most likely time you're going to have any engine troubles. When you're coming back, you've been flying for a long time. Then why not have a vertical separation of inbound coming in at 1,000 feet or below and outbound going out at 2,000 feet or above or something like that? That's just a thing that I think about all the time. Well, we actually did that. 
get out of jail card free. <laughs> you need more than one jury. You need to buy about a six pack. Anyhow, so let's take a quiz. Everything we've talked about today, or excuse me, everything that's in the quiz was talked about today. So let's do it. Feel free to yell out the answers. If you've seen it before, maybe you can just pull back a little. All right, 90% of mid-airs happen in DFR, IFR. True or false? True. 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 Why? Everybody's relaxed in IFR. Well, I'm more flying. Okay, and we have coverage and separation, right? But we could be IFR on top, correct? In VFR conditions, you know, you can do that. Take an IFR clearance, go anywhere you want. You can turn left, that you don't have to be on one of those blue lines. All right, true. All right, where do 80% of the net airs happen? There's a lot of different answers. Shoot me one. In the sky. In the sky. <laughs> get, the, get the gentleman the card. <laughs> That's the first time I've heard that one. All right, where do 80% of the mid airs happen? Near an airport. Good man. What else? Clear blue skies. Right on. Nice day. Flight quarters. Flight quarters. Good point. Where else? Choke points, rivers, good. Choke points, right point, Mackenzie. We don't know why we haven't had more there. I agree with uh, Dylan there. When I learned to fly, man, I had that thing on 2,000 feet when I was across the point again. I didn't know nothing else but 2,000 feet. And after a couple thousand hours, I said, this is pretty dumb. Every day we there at 2,000, so good for your doing what you do. Within 10 miles of the airport, you covered that. <clears throat> what is the most common phase of flight during a midair? Cruise. Cruise? Okay. Anything else? All right, turning, climbing, descending, formation, flying. <laughs> Which one? B, climbing and descending. Okay, but I think we could give credence to all of those things. And I think Marcel did a great job of talking about deck angle on the aircraft and things like that. Other than around airports, where's the greatest risk for the mid air? GPS. GPS routes, super good. Marshall, when he goes from Nome to Russia, don't have to worry about it too much. <laughs> Those that we send at Dead Horse, uh, Aglin Company for offsetting off the airways on the routes that are popular for them, there are popular travel times. I mean, we know when the Boeing comes in and unloads uh, 128 people that uh, they're going somewhere. They just didn't come to hang around without the Boeing. Uh, where else? Flying along beaches. Oh, man. Come on. We've all gone down to Silver Sand Creek and Polly Creek and that stuff and we're down even in that uh, accident uh, that there was a super gun down there at uh, 73 knots and 70. Falling roads and rivers, right? Flying at a mountain pass, so I'd say if we're going to Lake Clark, we'd fly through the pass, Chicklin, Shirley Brady, so that's maybe what we want to look at. What do you think it is? Probably <laughs> okay. All right. Why mid airs happen? We talked a lot about that. Looking at our TV screen. We're going to get more TV screens. Paper's going to go away. Cockpit fantasization, whatever that word is. Thank you. Uh, Marcel talked about 60% of the time outside, right? That's not bad, but you know what? I was one of the first air taxis here to get like a Apollo Loran and they flew it from here to Splint and I never looked outside the whole route. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Failure to clear blind areas, Marcel spoke about that. <coughs> Talk about that here in a little bit. Proximity of choke points. Uh, we all know when we're going to Lake Clark Pass since 2000, it was a pretty good day for us during the uh, rainbow season or something like that. We all know that we're going to run through there. The Lake Clark Pass, right? We all know that when we're going at the Desh River, King Salmon fishing, we're all going to go by the mouth. At one time when I threw the number 23 6 out, we used to have a frequency for the Desh River only for 45 days. There is that much traffic. In attention to traffic calls, uh, Dylan said and uh, Sean mentioned how much they made traffic calls, but also need to remind those guys to listen to. So, what's his saying? Listen twice as much as you talk. That's why the good Lord gave you two ears. Rules of the road. So, if we're going to pass northbound, are we on the right side? Of course, that's what we want to do. All 
All right, Marcel talked about 60% out. We know we got all these things they're sure looking at fine. The lady said she flies a Super Cub unless you fly a real high performance airplane. I don't think you really care if you're going to 86 or 87. I have a V-18, I took the GPS out three years ago, you know why? I fly to look up the window, not to look at the little gauge that tells you whether I'm doing 86 or 87. So that might help my lookout doctrine a little bit better. I don't know. But when I do dump in the airplane inside, I want to go to Oshkosh, it's kind of nice to get that airspace out there. All right, <coughs> highway and low wing, I think we kind of all got that figured out without belaboring it. Um, you know where the aircraft is, sometimes you have to move the airplane. I think uh, Mr. Bronson uh, mentioned that, lifting the wing before they uh, got into some course areas or closer to an airport or issues like that. Uh, so that's a pretty simple one to figure out. IFR, right? We all follow roads? Or rivers? Yeah, what else? Railroads. 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 What else? <laughs> so does everybody else. So, uh, Dylan talked about the offset. I talked about the offset of going up to Dead Horse. Maybe why not do that every once in a while? Why, when you leave here and you decide you're going to squid, why not maybe just go over a couple miles or something? Might be some new scenery for you. You'll see Lockwood Lake and some other places you uh, probably have never, never seen before. Just discuss that. All right, which aircraft's the highest threat? Those of you who have seen this, if you remain silent, that'd be great. The one behind you, all right? Yes. The one you can't see. Where's the guy that said fly? Yeah. <laughs> he gets a card. All right, here it is. Which aircraft's the highest threat? There's seven of them out there. <laughs> Bottom right. All right. You sure? Who said there were seven out there? That was, that was pretty neat. It's number two. For those of you who get, didn't get it, that's not a bad thing. You're not supposed to get it. As Marcel said, remember he used that 10 to o'clock thing? That's exactly what he's talking about. It's hard to see that aircraft that's kind of approaching right now. So let's do it again just in case. So you notice it's not changing much in size. Yeah, and so the very few things. So, so it's not bad not to get it, it's just to show that. Jet Ranger, the worst thing in a Bell Jet Ranger 206 is the door post right here. You can't see nothing out of it. You can look to your left, you can't see nothing out of Jet Ranger. I'm going to tell you this a 172 and a 207 is the exact same thing as that large door post. I'm sorry to see that. You kind of mentioned that a little bit of All right, uh, that's probably enough of that stuff. ADSB, uh, thank you for your comments, Ken. Um, we're required to have it by when? With the airspace most of us fly in, we really don't. We really aren't required. Do we want to see the government pass a new law? No. How many think we got too many regulations? Raise your hand. I do. I think we got too many. So I got to make you guys a deal. You don't want no more new rules? Don't have no accidents. Because <laughs> the government is proactive. We never do anything proactive. Thanks for your time.